Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Greetings, everyone. On behalf of Adrilinx and USAID's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, this is Adam Ahmed, and we will have a presentation today on market-based agricultural technology, scaling and fragmented market settings, and we will give three cases. Please communicate with us using the chat pod today, and we will take your questions during the Q&A portions of this webinar. I would now like to hand it over to Julie Marsh with USAID's Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance. Julie, take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you all for participating, especially to our speakers, who my colleague will introduce more thoroughly in a moment. But I'm thrilled to see such a great gathering of people. I think you'll agree that the very notion of market-based agricultural technology scaling in challenging or fragmented contexts reflects a gradual shift of approach to humanitarian response and recovery programming. Ten years or so ago, the use of the market system to support response and build pathways to recovery for vulnerable populations was just beginning to be written into guidelines experimented with on a wide scale and identified as a best practice when looking at long-term market system health. I'm sure you're all familiar with the old way of doing things, which was direct provision of goods and services, top-down directives, um, and support that gradually over time has been replaced by expanded choice and capacity building for informed and responsive choice at the household level by the people affected by um, different types of crisis and context. Many of us remember and still see support that's short-lived and poorly targeted. So thinking about free unadapted seed, free vaccinations that undermine other commercial enterprises and um, items like this. As we look for more ways to support vulnerable populations by giving them access to what they need to make informed and real-time decisions related to agriculture and livestock production. Now more than ever, the use of market-based options to reach the last mile are critical. Today we're going to hear about three experiences, um, market-based mechanisms for scaling hermetic post-harvest grain storage technologies. We'll be looking at assessing opportunities for irrigated seed production to not only improve nutrition and help with climate risks and water insecurity, and we'll also be looking at provision of privatized community-based animal health systems, um, particularly for agro-pastoral and pastoral areas. I hope that these topics and these speakers are going to encourage even broader conversation and discussion. I think we've made a tremendous amount of change um, over the last decade or so, and I think we're seeing even more evidence that this is a path to a more sustainable market-led future. I'm going to hand it over now to my colleague, Joe Deaver, to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Our first two speakers are teaming up to talk about irrigated seed production in seed markets. Um, Nicole Lafour of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Small Scale Irrigation and Jean-Baptiste de La Salle Pignere, World Vegetable Center. As director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Small-Scale Irrigation at Texas A&M University, Nicole leads a global interdisciplinary research team to identify ways to scale the agriculture, water management, and small-scale irrigation to strengthen nutrition and improve livelihoods. Dr. Tignere Kinere leads the Allium breeding program at the World Vegetable Center in Mali where he works on the development of short-day onion varieties with adaptations to humid and dry seasons. Prior to joining the World Vegetable Center in 2014, he worked for 26 years at the Environmental and Agricultural Research Institute in Burkina Faso as a grain, legume, and molecular breeder. Our second presentation today is on private sector animal health service provision is Susan Bishop project and technical officer at the Livestock Emergency Guidelines and Standards Organization, widely known as LEGS. Susan has over 25 years experience in development and emergency response relating to livestock and livelihoods, including 17 years working in the Horn in East Africa 
where she focused on areas affected by drought and complex emergencies. Susan has a particular interest in primary animal health systems and community-based animal health services. Our final speaker addressing private sector scaling of hermetic storage technologies is Brett Rearson, Managing Director of Harvest Innovations Limited, a social enterprise based in Kampala, Uganda. The mission of Harvest Innovations is to drastically reduce post-harvest losses for Africa's 200 million smallholder families with the goal of at least 50 million families using hermetic storage at home by 2030. Prior to starting Harvest Innovations, Brett led the World Food Program's Global Post-Harvest Knowledge and Operations Center, NOC, which was responsible for bringing the World Food Program's success and leadership in eradicating post-harvest losses to smallholder farmers around the world. So those, that's our lineup of exciting speakers. And I will now hand it over to Nicole LaFour, who will uh, make our first presentation on irrigated seed production. Yeah, thank you. So the presentation I'll do today is on a research study that is in progress. So I do have to say that to begin with because there are some things that uh, we were sort of um, have on pause, let's say, um, while we can't be in the field. But we're presenting what we can as of today. So a little bit of context, this project is focused in Mali. Um, and what we, have look, what we are looking at is the lack of nutrient-dense foods and how that affects the nutrition of households. And since the 1990s, um, the import of fruit and vegetables has increased tenfold. It suggests a high demand for um, vegetables and fruits, but we also are seeing a lack of seed to be able to produce that domestically. So what we're looking at in more detail is how that need and that demand and that it continues to grow could be met through irrigated production. However, this is within a context of weak market conditions. There is a low density market for irrigation equipment, so it's hard for farmers to get it. There's a fragmented seed market between formal and informal markets and production, and therefore reliance on imports. And there's been a lot of disruption to markets related to insecurity, which can be both periodic and specific geographical areas. And then there are additional agronomic challenges, um, which can be then affected by the markets for inputs, as well as for finance, which is often disconnected. So we've done an initial study, and this was led by IFPRI, um, based on existing data in Mali. What we found is that irrigating households consume more nutrient-rich food groups, so that nutrition improves through own consumption. They also benefit from higher agricultural income, so that's the income pathway to improve nutrition. They usually irrigate rice. There's very few that irrigate vegetables, and they find a low access to seed and affordable irrigation, specifically for vegetables, but also other, um, other commodities. In terms of the factors that affect their ability to adopt irrigation, we find education, non-farm income, participation in farmers groups, and market access, um, which is a big focus of our study. And currently, only about 4% of plots of farmers are irrigated. Our irrigation focuses on household level irrigation, so this is what farmers can invest in themselves as opposed to large infrastructure schemes um, supported by donors or development partners or government. This is just a visual on the pathway to sustainable irrigation scaling. So you can see it's a very complex ecosystem. And we're focusing largely around the market systems, which is in the bottom left-hand side. But we also recognize that the institutional policy and regulatory con context heavily influences whether that market system becomes more um, dense and more integrated or whether it remains fragmented. So currently, the finance system, the equipment supply chain for irrigation, and the value chains themselves, so things like the inputs, the seeds, um, as well as the output markets, those are all fragmented. And it makes it very difficult for farmers as well as other companies 
to be able to succeed in the vegetable market. So some of the constraints to scaling in a little bit more detail. Um, as I've mentioned, there are localized and national crises, and sometimes that is security, but oftentimes it's also climate driven. So it's the lack of water that's um, regular, reliable, not just during the rainy season, but also through a long dry season. There's also um, a focus in the formal seed companies, which in itself is quite limited, but it focuses on particular what they call exotic vegetables, so not necessarily nutrition-dense vegetables that um, are traditional to the area. And there's also an informal seed sector that provides seed for the traditional vegetables. And um, my colleague from the World Vegetable Center will talk more about that. There's, um, as I mentioned, also a reliance on imported vegetables and vegetable seed. And the, the reliance on the importation reduces the resilience within the local market and it increases the vulnerability to conflict and market disruptions. And the seed producing cooperatives, which are largely responsible for seed production, um, do face um, constraints related to the unreliable rainy season, which is one of the reasons why we're focusing on opportunities for irrigation. So the focus of this particular study is on the seed system because seed is such a constraint to vegetable production. We are also looking at this within the context of food security in the food system. Um, we're very interested in how seed and vegetable production affects nutrition, but we also integrate a lens for wash and gender empowerment because those are quite interrelated to the nutritional outcomes. So the study will be assessing formal um, seed sector particularly, but also in relation to the informal seed sector. Um, five priority vegetables that we'll be looking at is the African eggplant, onion, shallot, tomato, and pepper. Um, even if in some cases that the um, pathway to nutrition is not through own consumption because households may only be able to consume so much pepper or onion, um, we do find in our research that there is a strong pathway through income and these vegetables do provide those households with a strong income pathway to improve nutrition and livelihoods. And the seed sector analysis is doing a situational analysis of the market and how that operates and what that uh, policy regulatory environment is as well as that currently fragmented system for the market. Um, we're looking at where the potential is for irrigation to strengthen the seed supply in particular. And we are focusing on where the entry points could be to strengthen that market system and to have more integration. So at this point, I would like to hand over to my colleague from World Vegetable Center who's leading this study in Mali. So Jean-Baptiste, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, vegetable production in Mali. Irrigated vegetable is high performing across seasons. Major vegetable is on the dry season uh, irrigation uh, are mostly um, concern mostly uh, sorry mostly tomato African eggplant hot pepper shallot onion potato and leafy vegetable vegetable production on the irrigation is an alternative water shortages at critical production phases of vegetable crops. However, vegetable production is affected by low access to seed, water, market, losses during post-harvest storage, lack of information. Uh, vegetable production uh, in Mali, the role of irrigation. In that slide, we just want to show you that yield performance of more than 30 ton per hectare can be achieved on the farmer's field for tomato when good agricultural practices are coupled with access to water for dry season irrigation. This data 
were pulled from Africa Rising Project, a USAID funded project implemented in Mali together with IITA, IPV, ICRISAT, ILWE, IMI, and local partners. This picture shows some of the irrigation options, drip and gravity systems proposed to farmers involved in the best practice hub in Sikaso region in Mali under USAID Mali scaling project, a project that ended in, in 2019. The best practice hub are kind of technology parks equipped with vegetable production facilities to facilitate learning and linkages across vegetable value chain in Mali. Vegetable seed sector. Two seed systems coexist in Mali and in the ECOWAS region. There is a strong informal seed system where traditional seed production and uh, supply uh, is uh, conducted with seeds produced without compliance with seed regulation. Seeds are traded directly hand to hand uh, or sold in local markets. Next to these systems, to this informal seed system, you also have a weak formal seed system. Seed regulation law exists at national and regional level. Recently, efforts were made towards harmonizing both regulation systems for more synergistic action in the region. Uh, with this picture, without going into detail, this picture depicts the general structure of, uh, of the formal seed system in Mali, showing the categories of seeds, the actors involved, and their role. There are firstly research institutions, including IER, the National Research System, and World Vegetable Fund. Center, which provides foundation seed to partners. Then we have the regulation education represented by the National Seed Service hosted by the Ministry of Agriculture. And their role is to train and also uh, provide seed certi certification service. And lastly, we have production actors that comprise farmers, seed, individual seed farmers, seed enterprises, and uh, other actors, and also uh, international seed companies. Jean-Baptiste, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you just speak up a little bit louder so the audience can hear you? So the, the major, the issue with seed quality, the major issues affecting seed quality are, firstly, lack of knowledgeable vegetable seed experts, breeders, seed regulation, seed regulators, seed enterprises, etc., to support quality seed production. Secondly, seed system of vegetable is weak as compared to that of cereal. As you may know, there is no seed company per se in the, the region, but starting seed enterprises funded by AGRA. AGRA is the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. There is no quality control for improved vegetable seed by regulators. Sorry for, for excuse me. There is no quality control for imported vegetable seed by regulator and uh, which sometimes results in fake seed distribution by agro dealers. And finally, farmers lose out because 
is no compensation for losses from low quality. This uh, is a picture taken during a follow-up visit of a gravitary irrigated onion seed farm led by Coprosan, a dynamic farmer cooperative in Kai in West Mali. This cooperative produced more than two to three tons of certified onion seed per year, and they also own onion seed conditioning and packaging facilities. So having said that, I would like to hand over to Dr. Nicole for uh, the conclusion. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste. Yes, yeah, so I think just in summary, the point is to say that irrigation actually improves household nutrition through multiple pathways. Um, but that looking at the fragmentation of the market, we see the limitations and how those, um, that lack of integration in the market um, decreases resilience and increases vulnerability, um, but also limits the ability of people to um, irrigate vegetables and therefore also produce seed for vegetables. Um, and so one of the things that we are going to be looking at um, with some private sector companies is increasing access to both the irrigation equipment and seed. Um, so I, I do want to just mention, um, because there are some questions related to it, and I'll mention this very briefly, which is to say that there is a water availability component to this, where we use remote sensing, water accounting, uh, modeling and on the ground household level validation of water availability. And that water, those water availability studies um, consider also factors around market and, markets and infrastructure. So we do suitability mapping um, related to um, where water is available for irrigated production. And we look at specific crops, so we also look at things like um, agronomic cycle, temperature, um, and those types of factors. So as we move forward, we're identifying specific entry points to support that market integration by linking with private sector um, equipment suppliers and farmers. And um, we do that all within a framework for sustainability, um, both economically and in terms of uh, water availability, um, so that we don't reduce the water security of households and uh, watershed and basin level. So with that, I'll stop there. And um, we can go on to questions, or I'll, at least I'll hand over to the facilitators to, to direct us here. Thank you, Nicole and John Baptiste. Um, it's a fascinating uh, study that's, that's moving forward, and it'll be really exciting to see what the um, end results of that were. Um, yes, we do have a couple questions um, that have come in. Maybe I'll give one for Nicole and one for uh, Jean Baptiste. Um, there was a question related to the uh, irrigation canal for Jean Baptiste, and I think it was related to whether that's something that the farmers themselves can um, achieve, or whether that had to be supported with outside. Uh, funding. Ah, okay. okay, thank you. I would like to answer this question. Um, let's say that farmers are already uh, struggling to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to not depend on the health because when um, some water rivers, water is available, um, they work collectively to have irrigation facilities, like uh, getting uh, low-cost uh, motor pump to ease uh, gravity irrigation, or in some places, digging wells, shallow wells, they are shallow wells, that they enable them to get at least one or two harvests uh, from vegetable production 
and then they have to stop because the watershed will uh, get deeper and deeper. So um, what we need to do is to, according to me, is to help them with uh, what I call durable uh, production facilities, like um, instead of using uh, fuel motor pumps based on the uh, consumption of fuel, this could help them with system that use uh, solar power. I think that this kind of system is more durable for them than uh, uh, like uh, buying fuel for motor pump and uh, other systems where they have deep, deep well and they have to uh, struggle a lot to get water for the uh, uh, potable water for themselves and then to irrigate their fuel. So I think I have provided some element of answer to this question. Jean Baptiste, if you could please speak up a lot sure. louder, the audience uh, is having trouble hearing you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Jean-Baptiste. Um, and now maybe if we have one question for Nicole. Uh, there was a, a question from Ernest Bethe. Uh, what besides identifying issues and limitations did the Mali project do? It's a multi-question here. And what are the market-based mechanisms for scaling that were undertaken? Is this just a scoping project to define the issues and entry points? Thank you. Yes, and we're actually in the middle of the project. So this is a little bit premature for us to even be presenting. But um, essentially what, we're, what is in progress right now is understanding, first of all, um, the water availability and ensuring um, that water is available where the markets are um, and understanding the, the crop cycle in relation to water availability. And we always do that prior to market intervention so that we don't risk water security. Um, and then the other thing to mention is, in terms of the scaling, what we're doing is we will catch up in Mali with the other countries we're working in in the region. And we work with solar pump suppliers um, who use market-based um, mechanisms. And so we work with them in terms of developing instruments and tools for them to work directly with farmers to ensure the suitability of equipment. We look at facilitating linkages to markets. Um, we look at uh, mechanisms such as crop cycles and planting schedules um, so that um, there isn't gluts in markets. So basically, we try to address some of the market failures by working directly with companies in the context. And we also set up uh, platforms where the different, basically, linking those different uh, fragments of that market so that there's better sharing of information um, and that they can harmonize their tools and approaches in particular geographic areas. And so that is our approach in Mali. Um, it's just that uh, it has, as I mentioned, been paused because of um, not being able to be in the field at the current moment. So um, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to get into the field with the companies and directly with the producers soon. Um, so we've focused here mostly on the scoping and showing where the opportunities are and what some of those constraints in the feed system market are. Um, and then we'll be working directly in the field with different market actors to try to address some of those issues. Thanks very much, Nicole. Okay, maybe now we'll move over to our next speaker, um, Susan Bishop from Legs. Thanks very much for that. Um, so this afternoon I'm going to make a presentation um, considering how private community-based animal health services that assist livestock owning communities can be better supported by implementing agencies. And uh, the presentation draws on lessons learned from the Legs Operational Research Project funded by USAID OSDA. So, I'm going to start off by giving a little bit of context on LEGS. Uh, LEGS uh, is short for Livestock Emergency Guidelines and Standards, which are a set of international guidelines and standards for designing, implementing, and evaluating livestock interventions 
to help people affected by humanitarian crises. And it draws on the experience and process of SPEAR, which some of you or many of you may be familiar with. And LEGS is based on three livelihood objectives. So to provide immediate benefits, to protect the livestock assets, and to rebuild the livestock assets of crisis-affected communities. And you'll see there on the right of the picture the, a picture of the LEGS handbook, which can be downloaded uh, from the web, LEGS website. So, moving on to um, the rationale for LEGS. So, the LEGS process grew out of the recognition that livestock are a crucial livelihood asset for people throughout the world, many of whom are poor and vulnerable to both natural and human-induced disasters and that livestock support is an important component of emergency aid programs. Um, the rationale for LEGS is linked to cycles of often inappropriate and badly implemented livestock relief projects linked to poor analysis, local capacities and services often overlooked or undermined, urgency and timing are often used as an excuse that assistance can arrive late, even in slow onset droughts. Um, there is frequently limited impact assessment to document lesson learning, um, and sometimes weak coordination between the development and emergency sectors. So moving on to the aims of LEGS, um, this is to support the saving of lives and livelihoods through two key strategies. Help to identify the most appropriate livestock related interventions in emergencies. Provide standards and actions and guidance notes for these interventions based on good practice. So LEGS focuses on the areas where emergencies, livelihoods, and livestock overlap, emphasizing the need to protect livestock during emergencies, as well as to help with rebuilding livestock assets afterwards. It covers all livestock, from chickens to large animals, including animals used for transport or draft power. And it also covers rural communities, farmers, pastoralists, as well as peri-urban and urban livestock keepers, and people um, displaced. So just briefly, um, the LEGS Handbook is made up of uh, nine chapters and two sections. The first section focuses on general principles, decision making and planning. And the second section covers the technical aspects of specific interventions such as destocking, veterinary support, seed supplies, provision of water, livestock settlement and shelter, and provision of livestock. So the next chapter on technical standards for veterinary support highlights the role of the local private sector as an essential element in emergency response and promotes the use of a community-based animal health care system, including voucher schemes where markets are working. The chapter also highlights the negative impacts that free distribution of veterinary pharmaceuticals can have on the private sector and on the long-term livelihoods of livestock keepers. Anecdotal evidence, however, has suggested that Donor requirements for quality and effectiveness pose a challenge for implementing vet voucher schemes specifically with regard to complying with donor procurement, storage and distribution regulations to maintain the quality of the pharmaceutical supply chain. To overcome this, um, USAID or FDA provided funding to LEG for a two-year operational research project which was carried out in Ethiopia, Zimbabwe and Kenya. The research aimed to identify and test alternative program models for the application of LEG standards whilst complying with key donor regulations using emergency veterinary voucher schemes. And the research model um, drew on USAID and OSDA pharmaceutical requirements and guidance and LEG's handbook guidance on community-based animal health care and vouchers. There were six elements of the research model together with key criteria. So the research aimed to test the model of animal health treatment voucher schemes using community animal health workers in Ethiopia and Zimbabwe and animal health service providers in Kenya. Um, veterinary voucher pharmaceutical supply chain and quality um, used OFTA approved wholesalers and licensed PVPs who are able to procure, store and supply approved pharmaceuticals. Community awareness and behavior was critical in this, including community engagement in planning activities around prioritization of diseases, community animal health worker and beneficiary selection, and pricing discussions. Um, the voucher scheme included elements one to three um, that ensured good coverage and targeted vulnerable community members. And the vouchers were designed based on consultation with the private sector to determine appropriate values for delivery of services. A monitoring system was set up, which included checking batch numbers, packaging and sorting of drugs, to random inspection of community animal health workers and pharmacies, 
um, and included baseline and endline studies with beneficiaries and service providers. But a very key element to all this is the policy context. And this looked at whether there were appropriate policies in place to support privatized services and also the veterinary pharmaceutical reg regulatory policies, including licensing and inspection procedures for wholesale and private pharmacies. And the main recommendations from the research are set out in the following slides according to seven of the LEGS core standards common to all livestock interventions. But you'll notice that there's no core standard four on initial assessment and response identification, as this is not included here as part of the research. So although the work focused on emergency context, the lessons learned are equally applicable in non-emergency situations as they lay the foundation for long-term sustainable services to be developed and supported. So what are the key elements for the robust private animal health services in emergency context? Well, moving on to the core standards, the next core standard one is participation. So community involvement is essential in all stages of a community-based animal health project, from initial awareness raising, community animal health worker selection, payment for services, and feedback sessions to authorities and implementing bodies. Communities need to have full knowledge of the proposed interventions, specifically on issues around service costs and drug pricing, so these can be discussed and agreed pre-implementation. Next core standard two is preparedness. Um, and Lex recognizes the importance of supporting local private sector actors. And the preparedness planning recommends building the capacity of communities and existing organizations. The systems need to be in place as part of a functioning privatized animal health sector to be able to react to emergencies as they arise. In locations where private services exist, the provision of curative services by government vet staff, often at subsidized rates, can lead to an undermining of the emerging private sector, as does the free distribution of some drugs and vaccines by both governments and agencies. And this issue, unfortunately, is further compounded by the ready availability of poor quality and counterfeit drugs at low cost. The research aimed to find opportunities for engaging private veterinary pharmacists and private CHWs within a system that had long-term potential. So in order to achieve this, it requires a good understanding of the market chain and demand and supply by all implementing stakeholders to help the pharmacists and the CHWs orientate themselves as business people. The leg standard on monitoring and evaluation emphasizes the importance of establishing effective monitoring systems prior to implementation. And the research findings reinforce this point. As previously mentioned, random inspections based on online surveys was used as part of this ME system. Next core standard three focuses on competencies. So standardized national guidelines for competencies of different cadres of frontline animal health service providers allow for appropriate training course content and for refresher training. The training course content should also be flexible to allow for priority local diseases to be targeted. Providing business training and supporting animal health service providers to develop business skills is integral to establishing lasting private services. And uh, the training guidelines can be used by implementing agencies to monitor the competencies of AHSPs. Although this monitoring should be undertaken by a regulatory body, um, this often is not the case. Um, and implementing agencies, importantly, need to understand the legal context and the national standard on the roles and responsibilities of the various cadres of animal health service providers so that they can provide the necessary support. In Ethiopia, for example, a government-certified standardized training course for supporting documents is available for training community animal health workers. So, moving on to Legs Course Standard 5, this is looked at technical assessment and intervention. Whilst a few specialist livestock and animal health NGOs exist, multi-sectoral organizations frequently take on animal health activities. In-house experience and technical skills for both developing and implementing these projects are essential from the concept mate stage through to the end of the project, where agencies implement community-based animal health projects without the necessary experience and knowledge, problems can arise. For example, a lack of understanding of the need to avoid providing free treatment, which can lead to privatized services being undermined. So when it comes to ensuring the quality of veterinary medicines, the role of the regulatory authorities and market chain actors in maintaining the integrity of pharmaceuticals through storage, distribution, and documentation practices needs to be assessed. There may be a need for implementing partners to work with private sector actors to build their capacities in these areas. 
In addition to this, uh, improved and simplified systems to verify drug quality, so for example, national guidelines, improved importation procedures, complemented by awareness raising and training on the importance of drug quality at all levels, and that can include importers, government service providers, communities, are also needed to address this issue. Next score standard five, six, sorry, is monitoring and evaluation. And the research model proposed a system that would record implementation and allow for course correction on veterinary drug use, management, and storage and distribution by all the key service providers, as well as community satisfaction. Um, key aspects include the things like random spot checks and kit monitoring. And ideally, these activities should all be part of government regulatory functions. However, in many cases, these are either weak or absent. And in these situations, implementing agencies will need to provide capacity building to help governments fulfill their monitoring role in the longer term. In the face of poor government regulation, implementing agencies should also take responsibility for ensuring that safe, quality pharmaceuticals are used in their projects and should also support good supply, distribution, and documentation practices by the market actors. So the next core standard is core standard seven, which is policy and advocacy. The countries where the research model was tested had different legal and structural environments regarding the delivery of animal health services to rural and isolated communities. So for example, in Ethiopia, Community animal health workers have been officially recognized nationally since the early 2000s, but in Kenya, community animal health workers are illegal and frontline services are provided by animal health assistants, amongst others. Community animal health worker schemes often face issues such as a lack of support from local and national authorities, the absence of a thriving private sector, inadequate training and limited understanding of the need for cost recovery by communities who may have been used to free services from governments and NGOs. So if CHWs are to provide an effective service, agencies need to advocate to governments at all levels and to professional veterinary bodies to promote the benefits of these services. Giving community animal health workers legal status helps to anchor them within the veterinary service structure, as well as ensuring there are national standards for their roles and training. And these standards should aim to provide the necessary quality assurance for drug management and use and for clinical services. So, finally, moving on to the last core standard, which is coordination, um, but very key. Coordination with other stakeholders, including government, NGOs, and private sector actors, also contributes to improved outcomes. So, essential elements of this would include having memorandum of understanding and detailed implementation plans agreed by all parties. These can play a major role in ensuring parties are clear in their roles and responsibilities and will improve coordination. Um, and essential is working in partnership with the private sector, particularly pharmaceutical wholesalers and private pharmacies, as an essential element in the sustainability of animal health services. So just to conclude, um, the key points to consider regarding legs in this particular context is that it recognizes the importance of the local private veterinary sector both during and after emergencies. LEGS recommends that support be given to local veterinary pharmacies and that community animal health workers be used where available, including through the use of voucher schemes. The use of voucher systems in emergency response has been hailed as an effective and efficient method in areas where markets are working, as the system ensures targeting of vulnerable beneficiaries and also it supports existing primary animal health services delivery system. So thank you very much um, for listening and uh, with that I shall hand back to the moderator. Thank you Susan. Thanks everyone. Before I hand it over to Jan I just wanted to remind everybody that we are taking a couple questions right now and then we will have a more general Q&A at the end of the presentation. Jan, take it away. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, we had one question come in for uh, Susan and it was related to um, fish farming and so the question is from Joseph Molnar. Hi Joseph, uh, thanks for the question. Fish um, it is a very good livestock? question and actually um, no, we didn't look at fish farming and to be fair, fish farming isn't something which is is specifically covered by legs as it's 
considered to be a very uh, specialized um, area um, and, and with many different um, contexts, I suppose, which are quite different to other livestock um, producing systems. So um, in short, the answer is no, I'm afraid. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. That's the only question we had come in for Susan. Maybe later on, folks will send in some more. Um, so for now, we'll just move ahead. And uh, Brett, over to you, please, with post harvest. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, good afternoon, to everyone. I'm up last. This is the hardest slot, as the bar has already been set quite high by Nicole, Jean-Baptiste, and Susan. Uh, also nice to see so many friends online, especially former colleagues from the World Food Program. Uh, Jean Damore, if you're still listening, we're going to hand over to you later on, so I hope you have your presentation ready. Just kidding. Um, some context. Um, for me, uh, as this is market-oriented, at least for my career, 17 years of it have been in the private sector, 15 years and more public, uh, a lot of it with the World Food Program. Um, went to business school. So for me, I have a private sector perspective. The message that you'll hear from me throughout this presentation is that in these dysfunctional markets that you need to prime the pump. And uh, similar to what Nicole highlighted, uh, to put the control into the hands of individual farmers, not large groups or community projects. And uh, no surprise, at least within the post-harvest world, when it's in the hands of women, uh, the results are even more impressive. Um, one other overarching point that I'd like to make uh, before diving in is that at least for post-harvest loss reduction, uh, this is not the time to further test efficacy. We know that it works, uh, but the thing that we're testing now are different market models. And I'd have to say that that message certainly has not gotten through to all of the governments at this point. Um, as we've had fruit and vegetables lead us off, I'm going to focus more on grain, but I'm happy to follow up with anybody offline afterwards. Um, in looking at, uh, go to the next slide here. So post-harvest losses, uh, the way that we look at it right now, it really is Africa's biggest challenge and biggest opportunity. Um, if you look at uh, the African Development Bank, looking at the, the market size for agriculture, it's a trillion dollar market over the coming years. And most people don't realize that post-harvest losses are, are kind of the elephant in the room. They have a greater negative impact on Africa today than conflict, HIV, and malaria combined. And most people don't view it that way, and the farmers themselves view it as business as usual. The, the market for affordable post-harvest loss solutions themselves is, is five to seven billion dollars for the 200 million smallholder families. Um, I got some more information today that, uh, that said that, that number may even be very low. Um, but uh, the, the market is huge. But despite this market size, the proven demand, proven impact on families, scale really has not been achieved yet. And frankly, the question is why. This next slide looks at something that, um, again, I'm surprised that uh, in many of the presentations that I've made over the past four or five years across Africa, uh, that people do not understand yet the very simple technology, well, it's a complex technology in terms of uh, oxygen not being able to permeate these bags or plastic silos. But the way it works is pretty easy. And if any of you are out there willing to try this right now, just hold your breath. Uh, because if you hold your breath until you suffocate, you'll understand how these bags work in terms of eliminating the insect infestation in the grains and stored grains. And so even in very clean grain, you're going to have insects that have already laid the larva on the inside, and they'll hatch. But what we've seen uh, repeatedly is that, uh, and this is, again, not needing to test efficacy anymore, is the in insects suffocate on their own CO2. And then after that, the hermetic storage units uh, can be opened on even a daily basis if needed. Uh, there was uh, uh, an occasion in Rwanda with Grain Pro, one of the major manufacturers of hermetic products, where they had hermetic, um, they had maize and uh, cow peas stored for 12 years. And if you're interested, just go online to YouTube and look 12 years in Rwanda. Uh, and interestingly enough, even after 12 years, the germination rates were still quite high. So 
uh, again, I, the picture speaks louder than words. Uh, that's cow peas after 90 days. And uh, the, the technology simply works. So again, this is a simple, scalable, affordable solution. And this is not something that's new. Uh, it started back in 1982, funded by the Swiss, post Cosecha. And what uh, my work has been across right now 16 countries in Africa, as well as work in uh, China and some other Asian countries, is that consistently losses were brought from over 40% to less than 2%. And uh, that is across pretty much every crop group, uh, cash crops, as well as stable grain. And I think importantly, a very effective control or elimination of mycotoxin or aflatoxin contamination through the use of simple drying tarpaulins and then something as simple as a salt and bottle test to test the moisture content of the, um, of the grains being stored. But I, I think it's important to stress that it's really outcomes for these farming families that's more important than the output. All right? uh, it's not just about saving grain. Uh, consistently a two to three times income increase, um, sustainable food security for these families, uh, health and nutrition impacts that have been very clear, and shift of, of power really into the hands of, of women. And this has been backed up repeatedly. There was an MIT assessment that was done for USAID in Uganda, and you can see the results there. And some of the more interesting uh, research that's been going on right now has been by ETH Zurich. Um, Matthias and Michael, the team there, uh, in Tanzania, they, with 1,000 families, they had a 38% reduction in food insecure families within one harvest. And right now in Kenya, they have a random control trial going with 10,000 families that are looking at further detailing what are the impacts on income and nutrition. And uh, specifically and interestingly now, uh, how in a period with COVID-19 impacting some of agriculture in uh, this part of the world, well, in all parts of the world, um, looking at uh, how this has actually made the families more resilient and uh, resistant uh, to any of those market pressures. So again, the, the market-based solutions themselves, um, again, I stress my private sector background, they sound great. but uh, frequently in what I would describe as pretty dysfunctional markets, um, the lack of price transparency, um, at least what I've seen, people do have mobile phones uh, in many rural environments, but I think their use is vastly overstated. Um, and whether farmers are willing to use them in terms of the, the data charges, which again I compare to when I lived in China or in Asia, the data charges in, in Africa are still enormously high, comparatively speaking. The weak supply chains in terms of delivery of these hermetic products, um, lack of incentive to actually save the grain if you can't get your, your stuff to the market, um, huge issues with uh, corruption still. And uh, interestingly, the entrenched power structures um, give you a specific example. Uh, the Uganda Grain Council was actually telling farmers not to use hermetic storage because most of the people in that grain council are the rich farmers themselves, and they don't want to see a shift in uh, market dynamics because it benefits them as opposed to these many, many smaller farmers because it really does shift the control of the market pricing into the hands of the farmers. And I, the last point that I put on here, competing ideas from donors, I have never in my kind of 30-year career, private and public sector, have seen anything as impactful. Um, if you want to invest in seeds, if you want to invest in irrigation, and 30% of your crop is lost to, or 40% is lost to post-harvest losses, then that kind of undermines that as well. But there's so many competing ideas from donors that, um, that, uh, that, that that's also in the marketplace of ideas that has been a challenge. So, so what are the things that actually work right now? Uh, what are these options to overcome these dysfunctional markets? So ag results, I think, is a, a particularly interesting example. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody's aware of that. This was, uh, they had a variety of different things uh, across Africa, but for post-harvest in Kenya, a couple of years ago, they had prizes to incentivize the private sector to develop their supply chains. Um, now, they handed out $6.2 million worth of prizes. It cost around $5 million, from what I understand, to implement. Okay? And 
the thing that, that worked for this, and they, they tried uh, several different models in Kenya, but I'll give you one specific example. AgroZ is one of the major manufacturers of hermetic bags um, uh, globally, and especially here in East Africa. They're based in Arusha, Tanzania. And as a follow-up to these prizes that were awarded in terms of directly related to sales, uh, and this is what I mean about priming the pump, they've sold a half a million hermetic bags so far in 2020. This is a three-fold increase from 2019. Um, it, yes, it takes a little bit longer for them to get raw materials, but their business is going good even with the lockdowns with COVID. Uh, they did invest in the, the five-layer multi-ply machinery and have a capacity to do 5 million bags annually right now. They're, they're looking at 11 countries, um, Tanzania, Zambia, Uganda, Ethiopia, uh, Mozambique, Rwanda, Ethiopia, to, to name a few. And they, they view ag results as one of the, as fantastic. And one of the things that was good for them from their perspective was that that uh, USAID and the team from ag results actually dealt directly with the manufacturers themselves. Uh, several of the other companies, uh, Grain Pro used Farm Concern International, a company named Elite was also involved. They, they didn't really invest in their own distribution networks, but used NGOs, and that, that was found to be much, much less effective. Um, but so I, I think things like this can work. Um, interestingly, uh, when I was at the World Food Program, we used uh, discounts or subsidies. And that's been interesting. As soon as you say discounts to donors, they're very happy about it. The moment you say subsidies, which is effectively the same thing, people would get all up in arms and say this is uh, ruining the market uh, market incentive. But they they it was actually a slightly cheaper per farmer to do this than the ag results model. But the ag results model led to more of a long lasting distribution network because the companies invested in this to win some of this prize money. Another example is Vouch Digital, which is a Ugandan company uh, that I've worked with, where they actually had, again, incentives, discounts. Um, and the system there, and the reason why that kind of made the dysfunctional market work better, is that they had a online system. And it worked offline as well. And it's important in, in Karamoja, one of the more remote parts of uh, Uganda, or, or anywhere in Africa, and one of the least developed where you actually had the companies um, in the same system as the distributors. And the moment that the distributor got paid, there was a split digital payment that was done. And it, it, it immediately paid the suppliers of the products themselves. And that worked pretty well. I think Chombo from Vestergaard. Vestergaard is now making a single ply hermetic bag that is working very well. It is a, a drastic reduction in price. The, the AgroZ bags cost about two and a half dollars. I think Grain Pro is about the same for 100 kilos of storage. Um, and so Chambo's system uh, uses these less expensive bags, uh, but also links them to a kind of local entrepreneur with an online platform. Um, one other point I put here is establishing hermetic standards. This has been a challenge. Uh, the East Africa Grain Council uh, made a good effort at it. But just as an example, um, Malawi wants to set up their own uh, testing. And it'll take about a year to do the testing. And uh, instead of using bags that absolutely work, have been tested uh, by global standards, uh, PICS, Grain Pro, everybody knows that they work now. But these hermetic standards that have been established are not widespread yet. And that really has been a, a challenge. Okay, So uh, again, that 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 and kind of border controls really have been an issue. Very easy for AgroZ to get products into Kenya, uh, but it takes up to six months for them to get the same shipment into Uganda simply because the government continues to ask questions. Very briefly, and then I'll conclude, what has not worked, um, building large-scale collection points uh, and you know counting on structured demand really has not worked. There's been a lack of management there. Um, uh, at the at the local level, um, and in some cases, lack of lack of ethics. Um, the flavor of the month. Um, you had major donors like the Rockefeller Foundation go heavily into post harvest for about two years with yield wise, and then uh, there was a change in management, and that has pretty much ended right now, which is really tragic because it really did get a lot of things going 
um, very quickly. Um, one thing I'd love to see work, but um, haven't seen it effectively implemented yet, is lease to own, where either the major private sector companies do a uh, provision of these products. We've looked at this with Nile Breweries, uh, with Moquano, with some of the other larger industries here in East Africa. Um, but the lack of respect for contract law has kind of put that, um, so far, we haven't seen it work effectively. And um, I, again, I, just, I, I think that this needs to be a private sector-led activity, uh, but the priming of the pump is really important. Um, very briefly, what we've been doing is a training of power users, nudging of the private sector in terms of profitable supply chains, because to me, sustainability means profitability. And then uh, I think it's still important that there's effective monitoring and evaluation because be it governments or be it um, uh, donors themselves, they're still not aware of the potential impact that this has. And that's why I'm really excited about the ETH Zurich uh, work that's, uh, that's ongoing. And then lastly, um, how do you take this to scale? And to me, that's uh, the, the mass scale behavior change campaigns, similar to what was done with HIV or with malaria, or quite frankly, with Coca-Cola. Um, how do you make this a consumer product that is of interest for a, you know kind of aspirational consumerism? And I think that, to me, has has is where the greatest potential is. And again, our our target is to see 50 million adapt good practice and purchase this equipment, and uh, create this to be aware an awareness catalyst for these 200 million smallholder families. Um, if I would, uh, oops, sorry, you know, just to look at it in terms of a larger scale, how much does this cost to end uh, post-harvest losses um, on an African scale? We've looked at it kind of country by country in terms of what uh, we were previously doing with the World Food Program and some other organizations. And at this point, it's only $655 million uh, to, over the next 10 years, to really, uh, ending is probably a <laughs> A, a bit of a stretch, but to drastically reduce post-harvest losses. And I can tell you that's over, that's just about $3 per family, which quite frankly would be, I think, a, a good thing to invest in. Um, I leave you just with one final thought, it is uh, conversations that I was having with AgroZ uh, in the past week. They look at it right now as a market in East Africa alone of 300 million bags over the next 10 years, all right? And that is, I mean, that's $750 million of market uh, in East Africa alone. So when I talk about how big this market is, I may actually have understated it. And just one final slide, if you look at what happens in terms of post-harvest loss, I stress what happens in terms of women and their empowerment, but this impacts poverty, this impacts water, this impacts hunger, uh, there's, of course, Champion 12.3, which is reducing post-harvest losses. And again, if you look at in terms of where the biggest impact in terms of climate change right now, post-harvest losses trail only China and the United States in terms of climate impact. So you know, one relatively simple solution just has this massive cascade effect across the SDGs. Um, that's it for me. I'll hand it back over to the moderator. Uh, thanks for your attention and for hanging on, and happy to take questions. Thank you, Britt. Um, yeah, you definitely generated a lot of questions coming in, um, so that's exciting to see. We'll ask you a couple questions, and then we'll um, go around and start asking some of the other uh, speakers as well, the various questions that have come in as well for them. Um, and here's one that is uh, quite relevant now because it's related to COVID-19, and this is from Malika uh, Bonfour. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated the importance of preventing food loss. Did you develop low-cost technology for food? Um, so in uh, Burkina Faso, as well as in Mali, uh, we were working with several companies there that were using uh, convection. And it was focused on uh, Irish potatoes, as well as sweet potatoes, uh, as well as tomatoes. Tomatoes, we managed to get uh, up to about five weeks of usable life. 
beyond what the, the, the normal period was. Uh, and for sweet potatoes and Irish potatoes, we were looking at five to six months with some very basic um, you know, convection technologies um, using natural air flows and traditional methods. So while these hermetic bags are pretty sophisticated, um, uh, some of these things we did with fruits and vegetables were, were, were much, um, I guess I'd say much more traditional, but uh, certainly effective. The other thing that we saw with these hermetic bags is we did actually see people chipping and drying uh, some of these uh, vegetables, uh, specifically uh, potatoes. We also saw it with cassava and uh, them drying it uh, to, again, about 13%, uh, relatively easy to test with the salt and bottle, uh, salt and the bottle method. And uh, we, we saw those also be able to preserve uh, for months and months and months afterwards. Next question. Okay, thank you. Just jumped up. Um, you mentioned the example of the 12 years, and so we have a question from maybe Mohammed uh, Humayun Kabir. It says 12 years. Then how long uh, was the? So it, 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 I think that's an excellent question. And, and what had happened was there was a change in personnel in both the company as well as the government. That nothing to do with the with the genocide or anything like that. But it was. It was simply people forgot about it. And then when they did the test with germination afterwards, and again, the, even the 12 year, uh, there were effective, uh, a good germination rate. But I think, the, but I, I think that's an exception to the, to the rule. I don't think any of us are going to uh, recommend storing for 12 years. But the, the, the hermetic storage, both in the uh, silo, there was a picture I had in the slide presentation of the factory here with Smile Plastics making plastic silos, metal silos, which have started, you know, WFP started to use them in their school feeding programs to reduce losses. Even, uh, even the, um, well, any of these products, any of these, uh, these solutions, the germination rates were frequently higher than the traditional grain uh, that was stored simply because there was not any um, use of phosphine or anything else on them, uh, or they didn't have the impact of the insects. Um, so the, the germination rates with hermetic storage it remained very, very high. Okay, thank you. And then one more question for you um, before we move on to some of our other speakers. There's a question from Dick Tinsley. Are you anticipating the hermetic bags will move up the value chain with the farmer paying full cost? Or will the grain be repacked when I think that's an excellent question. I was actually hoping you were going to ask that because I could see that on the on the screen here. Um, I from, from what has happened, the the agro Z with two and a half dollars per bag, uh, there is it, the the economic return to the farmer is so high. And again, initially they're saying, well, it cost me you know two dollars for a PP bag or a dollar for a PP. Why would I pay more? Because they don't understand that market timing issue initially. After they see their neighbors, and again, the bag opening ceremonies with this and letting, I saw a comment earlier on the, on the chat group from Pete about doing community work ahead of time, and I think that's, that's excellent, is that the bag opening scenarios, uh, scenarios and proving that it works first um, and people seeing it with their own eyes, at that point, they were the ones who were buying and uh, at that price point at two and a half dollars. Now again, Vestergaard and the, uh, the bags that they have, the zero fly bags, now they have some with insecticide on the outside and some because they realize hermetics work so well without that. That's also uh, bringing that price point down. That's worked as well. Um, just one last example. Uh, I think the best case scenario, and this is where, for example, some of these grain councils, actually they're certainly not working on behalf of some of the smallholder farmers is uh, if you were to keep the uh, grain in the bag all the way to the market or in the silos, then that, that, that kind of a, um, eliminates the need for some of that processing. A specific example for that with cash crops in Ethiopia, GrainPro ended up working uh, effectively with the government and changing the testing procedure so that the bags were no longer punctured to test to make sure what was inside. 
but they opened them up, tested, resealed them, and then you have Grain Pro now, uh, they have whole containers of, of hermetic, uh, container-sized hermetic bag, or at the 100 kilo level, that bag would go all the way to the doorstep of the coffee shop in Europe or in the U.S. without being opened. So again, that value chain question that Dick asked is a very, very good one. And there are workable examples that are already out there. Uh, this is specific for cash crops, for coffee, for Ethiopia. Why other countries don't do that yet, uh, it just uh, that's, it never ceases to amaze me. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Brett. I have a couple of questions I thought maybe we could ask to Susan now. One is from Karim Karian uh, Deboer, and it's related to community animal health workers. As community animal health workers are not legal in Kenya and other countries possibly, okay, thanks how did question, legs Karian. work around um, it? I think I might call on my colleague Simon Kihu, who is actually worked with me on the project and is actually from Kenya himself, as he may be a um, better place to answer that question. Simon, are you able to do that? Thank you very much. Yes, Susan. Uh, in the case of uh, Kenya situation whereby the community animal health workers are not uh, uh, legal, what we did was to actually engage other service providers who are either certificate level, diploma or degree level uh, veterinarians in the community who work within the community and probably were doing already private work. And these guys were now uh, brought up together and uh, actually engaged within the project as part, part, some of the service providers. And in Kenya, this is where we also tested the e-voucher system uh, which, because, uh, as you know, the, these service providers of high caliber are very few, so they may not be uh, strewn across the pastoral communities. And therefore, the communities had to call them, and the e-voucher worked very well for that purpose. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Simon. We have another question also for, um, based on livestock and uh, for Susan. Sorry, my little screen here. Um, and this is from Getnet Ameha. Do you think of other embed um, okay. services um, for the thank community you, animal health I, I'm assuming, I'm not sure whether you mean in terms of the wider context outside um, delivering animal health services. So I'll look at both elements. So in terms of delivering animal health services, the community animal health workers would be um, providing advice and follow-up services as well as the actual clinical diagnostic and treatment services. So they would be you know, because they live within the communities, they are there to provide advice on an ongoing basis and then to revisit the cases to see how things are going and also provide advice on a wider um, production basis, I guess, not specifically related to a particular case. But I know there's a lot of discussion about how you can involve community animal health workers in um, supporting other services, so very much in, in the frame of the One Health situation, so how can you link them into working with the human health sector? And I know this is, has been tried over the years and, and in some contexts is still being tried. It is a complex area because if you're looking, you're looking at trying to link, I suppose, a private system, which is what the animal health services are aspiring to be, to a public system, which is often the case with what community health workers would be. And, and that is sometimes where it's quite difficult to find a system and a structure that actually works well. Um, but it is an area which is being explored. Um, in different parts of the country. It's not something that we, we looked at in this particular uh, operational research model, however. So, thank you. Thank you, Susan. I have a question here for Jean-Baptiste, um, and this is from Andy Okiror. How can the seed value chain be improved to reach the final user in time easily and cheaply.
Jean-Baptiste, you might still be on mute. For instance, for soft, can you not hearing anything, Nicole? Would, would that be you? something you? Go ahead. Okay. Yes, now we can hear. Ah, okay. Uh, I'm saying, saying that the best way, way to achieve it would be to reduce, uh, to improve access to seed in terms of uh, reducing the distance farmers should cover to get seed. In some cases, for instance, for vegetables, a variety we uh, uh, tested on the, uh, in demonstration field, farmers are happy of uh, the line, the variety, but to get this variety, they have to travel something like 400, 300 to 400 to get the seed. This is a bottleneck really we need to, and to, add to, to be able to do that, we need to get seed enterprises located at farmers' uh, places, or at least getting uh, some seed farmers in the village, in the close vicinity of uh, uh, the village, so that farmers can access uh, their preferred uh, crop variety uh, on time and easily. That's one, uh, uh, that's one thing. Um, another way is to, as I said, there is no seed company in West, in Mali per se. You have starting seed enterprises and they need to be strengthened so that they can um, improve, the, they can increase the, the quantity of seed uh, so that they can dis disseminate it to more area in uh, Mali, for instance. That are two key points I think we can tackle to um, avail more seed uh, to farmers in Mali. Okay, thank you. And then I have another question for you, Jean-Baptiste, related to the irrigation. Um, and this is from Ajit Srivastava. Uh, and the question is, is the drip irrigation system that you mentioned solar powered? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, one of the pictures I show, I took it from uh, uh, Best Practice Hub uh, uh, implemented by the Mali Scaling Project. In that project, uh, for the best practice hub, um, the irrigation facilities were provided by the project, and they have uh, they are using solar power. We have borehole equipped with solar panels that uh, provide uh, supply water to uh, all the, the farm. So both uh, gravity and uh, drip system are benefiting from the solar power uh, system. Hello? Hello? OK. Yes, Did you get my thanks. answer? Hello? Yes, I think I think we got it. Thank you, uh, Jean Baptiste. Uh, I have a couple questions here now for Nicole. Um, one also is from uh, Ajit Srivastava, Stata, and her question is: uh, What steps have been taken to scale irrigation? Um. So I think, um, as I had mentioned earlier in the in the presentation, that we are in the middle of this project. So 
Um, in terms of the scaling part, we haven't really started to test different business models. But essentially the approach is that we do the baseline research and we look at water availability and suitability mapping to figure out where this is even possible. Then we work with a number of partners across sectors and um, bringing them together to look at the uh, range of tools and um, yeah, the range of tools that are available to them. Some might be apps, some may be um, other types of tools that enable um, an assessment of uh, water resources and um, markets. Um, but essentially by, by bringing those together into a dialogue um, where they can start to tackle issues together. Um, so that's part of the approach. We also do business model development. So we do market assessments, cost benefit assessments, and then we look at business models that might work in that particular context, um, considering both the existing and um, more ideal scenarios for policy. Um, so the scaling approach is actually done primarily through the private sector partners. And we play that role of facilitator and helping to set up that engagement between um, different actors and across the sectors. And much like what Brett had said, um, this is a situation where you have to prime the pump. You have to support market density and, and that market intensification for irrigation equipment suppliers um, to make it um, more accessible to the farmers and to de-risk that investment in expanding markets by the private sector actors. So there's a lot of different pieces in that pathway to scaling. Um, and um, business models are one approach that enables us to try to look at those different pieces. And um, the dialogue process is um, helping to bring those pieces together. Uh, in, in Mali, we're quite um, uh, early in the process. Um, but we've been working on this in uh, Ethiopia and, and Ghana for a number of years. Thank you, Nicole. And maybe a little bit of a follow-up, a bit related to that question from Ramesh Deshpande. He says, um, what are the economics of irrigation facilities and are there subsidies involved? Right. So this is, it depends on the type of irrigation you're talking about. Um, Usually it's not a direct subsidy to a farmer, but oftentimes the big irrigation schemes are, are built with um, public funds. And sometimes the smaller households and, and uh, farmers in the area will, what's the term, sort of piggyback on those structures, even if they're not part of that formal scheme. So it's not a direct subsidy in that sense. Um, and in terms of um, the the private sector companies, it's not also, again, it's not a direct subsidy as such. There's ways that they can get access to funds that de-risk their investment. So these, particularly if you're using solar irrigation and solar pumps, you can um, tap into certain funds that reduce the risks for the companies who want to expand into frontier markets and to higher risk markets. Um, the other aspect of this that we see that is tends to be quite successful. Again, it's, it's priming the pump. It's, it's supporting market density in particular geographical areas. So it's not necessarily providing a subsidy to a farmer or to a company, but linking uh, farmers with sometimes produce buyers or NGOs who will help with a down payment on pumps. Normally, farmers don't have a problem making the regular payments, but to help them make that initial payment um, for that, for the um, to get access to that pump and other equipment to begin with. So we don't see a lot of direct subsidies, but we see these other ways of de-risking and providing indirect support. That's great. Thanks very much, Nicole. And then maybe just a couple last questions for Brett here. We've got one um, from Joseph Molnar. And his question is, what's the ecological impact of all these bags? And in brackets, I think they're worth it on humanitarian terms. What about uh, the actually, I bags saw that as question example. as well and responded briefly in the chat group, but uh, just for everyone's um, uh, benefit. What we found, these bags are not single-use plastic. Uh, they are used for a minimum of three, usually four to five harvests if they're, if they're taken good care of. And that's been consistent across all of the bag manufacturers. Uh, that's AgroZ, that's GrainPro, that's Vestergaard. Um, Elite was another company uh, that was uh, doing things here in Kenya as well. So, as well as PIX, I mean, PIX was the one that got this all started. But the other thing I think that's 
interesting to note is that in my years of doing this, and again, 16, 17 countries across Africa, I've not once ever seen a single bag on the roadside because this is very high quality plastic and it is repurposed afterwards either as roof lining or insulation or storage for household items, clothing, things like that. So the envir environmental impact is, is a good question, but yes, I agree, the impact of, of preventing you know, food insecurity, I think, is, um, is, is a value in itself. And then even more promising is Vestergaard has been looking, I believe, in Nigeria to start with, as well as in Ethiopia. They are recycling uh, their bags, uh, as, uh, as well as other forms of plastic, and starting to invest and wanting to invest in uh, and on the African continent. Uh, so you are starting to see the bag manufacturers themselves being able uh, to advance their own technologies enough to where they are recycling. But good question, Joseph. Thank you, Brad. Mm -hmm. um, let me just move my little slider across this. And then we, we also have a question from another question from Dick. Ah, okay. what I've also put a link into the chat group for everyone in response to that. Uh, so salt is hydroscopic. It absorbs moisture. And grain, if you put a grain into, uh, you know, take any glass bottle, um, uh, my current my, my current favorite would probably be Nile Special, uh, but any any glass bottle that you take, uh, if you put a tablespoon of salt and about one third full of grain and you shake it for a minute, the salt absorbs the water and it, it sticks onto the inside of the glass if the moisture is above 13 percent. And you want to store most grains at about 13 percent uh, and so instead of buying a $400 moisture meter that you need to then uh, spend a lot of money on uh, to calibrate every couple of years, um, I think the, a better choice for most of these smallholder farmers is uh, simply uh, any bottle that's lying around, uh, clean and dry with a little bit of salt, and you have yourself a very effective moisture meter. Uh, the video is there, um, produced by Sabo um, um, at, uh, in, in the chat group. Thank you very much, Brett. Over to you, Ahmed. Thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar today. We are approaching the end of the webinar, but thanks for sticking with us. I'm going to change the layout of the room to reflect the poll questions, so please answer those on your way out. And we also have some resources for you to check out. Um, it's been a pleasure, and we hope that you join us next week for our webinar on supporting the management of fall armyworm in Africa and Asia, best practices.